Hey guys, it's your Peacekeeper, coming at you with a little bit of history as to why the Tier 4 through Tier 7 U.S. battleships only go 21 knots in-game. To understand why they only go 21 knots, we first need to understand exactly what U.S. naval design was during the early 1900s. In-game, the USS Wyoming, Arkansas, New York, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and Colorado all only go 21 knots. That spans Tier 4 to Tier 7. The Wyoming, Arkansas, New York, and Texas are frequently called standards, but they are not actually U.S. standard battleships. The U.S. standard battleships were, in order of their congressional-approved build dates, the Nevada and Oklahoma in 1912, Pennsylvania in 1913, Arizona in 1914, New Mexico, Mississippi in 1915, although the Idaho was also added. Those are all three New Mexico-class battleships. The Tennessee and California, which were Tennessee-class battleships, in 1916. 1917, the Colorado, Maryland, West Virginia, and a fourth was planned, the USS Washington, which was not completed due to not needing her, really. So why are they called standards anyway? Well, the term standard comes from the desire to maintain a uniform battle line during combat. The analysis of individual ships to their foreign counterparts would certainly yield that U.S. ships were inferior on paper. However, the U.S. Navy never intended for these ships to fight one-on-one. -on -one. The observation of foreign Navy ships required a commander of a fleet to operate at the highest common speed for all of his ships while in combat. For the British, this was approximately 23 knots, and for the Japanese, this was approximately 22 and a half knots during World War II. Failure to do that meant that engagements would happen against the fastest ships first as they got into combat first. By unifying the speeds and turning radiuses of the ship, they were able to operate as a single cohesive unit. The standard design nature required that all ships be constructed to a similar top speed, roughly 21 knots, and have roughly the same tactical diameter of 700 yards, as well as having four gun turrets and two four two aft, as well as having similar hull design and armor layouts. Furthermore, U.S. naval strategist and captain of the Union Navy during the Civil War, Alfred Thayer Mahan, whom the Mahan-class destroyers are named after, knew that the U.S. had no real need to continuously pursue an enemy, so top speed wasn't a real priority. He knew that by continuously displacing an enemy from a position would eventually force that enemy to confront the U.S. battleship line as they ran out of places to run to. And he knew that the U.S. Navy was going to destroy them because they were this single cohesive unit that could concentrate all their firepower. This naval doctrine dominated U.S. naval design through the early 1930s. So what were the standards and why were they chosen? Well, the most obvious two standards were the speed and tactical diameters. The tactical diameter is the diameter of the circle that a ship turns when making a 180 degree turn. Those being 21 knots and roughly 700 yards for the tactical diameter. The 21 knot top speed was chosen as the pre-standard battleships, that being the Wyoming and New York classes, were still very new when these ships were all authorized for construction. The Wyomings were commissioned in 1912, the New Yorks in 1914, so by the time the U.S. standards were actually in the sea, those ships were still very new, and the U.S. wanted and needed to use those ships still, and those ships were limited in their top speed of 21 knots, so that was just kind of the standard chosen so that those ships could operate with the fleet. They also had the basically that same tactical diameter of 700 yards. There was also a standard gun configuration that was the four turrets, two four, two aft on all of the U.S. standards, which is another reason why the Wyoming and New Yorks are not considered standards. Also, the standards all had the same relative armor scheme, that being the all-or-nothing scheme. More specifically, the all-or-nothing scheme only armored the vital portions of a ship as opposed to armoring the whole of the ship. This allowed for heavier concentrations of armor over critical components due to imposed displacement restrictions by naval treaties at the time. The standards more or less all had the same belt thickness of 13 and a half inches, and their deck thicknesses were all roughly four and a half inches of combined deck thickness. The turret faces were all relatively similar with 18 inches of turret face armor. 
While the armor values of individual classes of ships and the standards was not exactly the same, the armor overwhelmingly hovered around those specific numbers. Relative hull design was also considered standardized. Only minor variations were made to the various standards based on the needs at the time. The New Mexicos introduced the first true clipper bow on a U.S. battleship. They also raised the secondary gun emplacements for drier shooting positions. The Tennessee class removed the whole mounted casemate guns and moved them to the main deck. The Colorados took the New Mexico and Tennessees and took it to the more extreme with a more extreme pronounced clipper bow, as well as even higher gun emplacements for the secondary guns. Furthermore, the single most important aspect of the standards came about from a uniform fire control system. The U.S. standards all operated with the Ford Mark I analog fire control computer, widely considered to be one of the best fire control computers ever designed. They also incorporated a gyroscopically stabilized vertical stable element that allowed for more accurate gun training during heavier seas as it kept the guns trained to the correct elevation as the ship pitched and rolled in the waves. This is akin to the gun training stabilization seen on many modern main battle tanks. Part of this system was also having the fire control directors located at equal heights, both fore and aft. This, of course, was removed during the 1920s and 1930 refits, and they were, that was not actually kept during the refits. So how did the standards actually perform? Well, there's no real easy way to compare it, because none of the U.S. standards saw any ideal combat condition that properly tested the design of the ships. In fact, the vast majority of these ships were only heavily damaged during the attack on Pearl Harbor. It is important to note that during the attack on Pearl Harbor, the U.S. Navy was in a peacetime condition and they were legitimately caught off guard by the attack. With that in mind, you can look at the results and kind of extrapolate some interesting data points. Of the eight standards present at Pearl Harbor, only two were complete losses, the USS Arizona and the USS Oklahoma. All the other ships were heavily damaged during the attack, raised, and rebuilt, and continued to fight through World War II. Upon further examination of the USS Arizona and the USS Oklahoma, the Arizona was sunk when an armor-piercing bomb penetrated the deck armor and detonated the forward magazine. It is unknown to this day exactly what set off the magazine, although there is plenty of speculation around the reasons and why. It is unclear if that was a flaw in the U.S. standard design or if it was some operational failure, but the common belief is that the black powder used to launch the catapult scout planes stored in proximity to the magazines, actually caused the explosion. The USS Oklahoma was hit by seven to nine aerial torpedoes in rapid succession with an unprepared crew. The Oklahoma sank on her starboard side. After the attack, she was righted. Coffer dams were built around her. The hull had the water pumped out, and the ship was made watertight again and floated to a dry dock for rebuilding. By the time 1944 rolled around, though, she wasn't rebuilt, and the decision was made to decommission her. Throughout the rest of the war, the standards were the recipient of 13 direct kamikaze hits, and in each one of the cases, they remained on scene and in combat operating conditions and continued to fight without issues. Torpedo protection was considered excellent, especially after the rebuilds from Pearl Harbor. The USS Maryland, which was a Colorado class, suffered a single torpedo hit in June of 1944. She sailed back to Pearl Harbor for repair was repaired and was back in action by August of 1944. The HMS Resolution suffered a single torpedo hit in September of 1940 that left her drifting helplessly. Her repairs would take from September of 1940 until October of 1941. This torpedo hit at the widest part of the Resolution's torpedo bulge and ripped a 50-foot hole in the bulge and a 20-foot hole in the armor behind it. HMS Barham and HMS Royal Oak each suffered triple torpedo hits during the war. The former, the Barham, capsized, exploded, and sank due to those damages while in wartime conditions. The closest approximation to this is Oklahoma receiving 7-9 to nine torpedoes and sinking during peacetime readiness levels. The Royal Oak suffered a similar fate to the Barham. She capsized and scap flow due to three torpedo hits. In terms of speed as protection... Speed did not save the HMS Resolution from her torpedo attack, although the tight tactical diameter of the U.S. Navy standards certainly allowed them to dodge numerous torpedo attacks from Japanese aircraft in the Pacific Theater. In terms of gunnery attacks, the USS Colorado suffered 22 medium caliber hits off a Tinian from a shore battery. While holed several times and having small fires on her deck, 
But Colorado remained on station in combat condition, continuing to fire at Japanese targets on the island while it was repairing all the damage that it was taking. The Japanese ships in World War II did not fare nearly as well as the British and U.S. ships did. Congo-class battleship Hiei received a similar assault to the USS Colorado and was rendered completely combat ineffective. She would later be scuttled by the Japanese as frequent air attacks threatened to sink her. Japanese battleship Fuso broke in half, capsized, and sank in battle-ready condition from just two torpedo hits. Oklahoma didn't begin to list at Pearl Harbor until the third torpedo hit. That's due to proper design and watertight compartmentalization. Yamashiro, another Fuso-class battleship, took four torpedoes and sustained bombardment from 14-inch, 16-inch guns to sink. However, one torpedo knocked out three turrets. The USS Pennsylvania suffered a single aerial torpedo hit while anchored at Buckner Bay in Okinawa. And while heavy flooding occurred, the ship remained afloat and able to defend herself with her guns. Well-trained damage control parties were able to stop the flooding and get the ship ready to be moved to shallower waters for repair work in less than a day. So what does this mean for in-game relevance? Why do I care about all this history? While we may loathe the slow speed of the ships, there are considerable advantages to only going 21 knots and having that heavy armor profile that the standards all had. The slower speeds give a captain ample time to judge the flow of a battle and decide whether or not he should change his tactics in response to the changing flow. While the slow speed prevents running away from a failed attack, the slower speed of getting into the engagement should allow an aware captain to remove himself to a better position prior to the battle going south on him. This also encourages development of what I consider to be the single most important skill a battleship captain could have. That's pre-planning engagements with attack and retreat routes, cover, while maximizing the number of broadside targets available to him. Furthermore, the armor scheme offers some very tough ships that benefit the most by armor angling, and the generous gun arcs allow them to engage while doing that. And of course, you've got plenty of armament fore and aft when pushing straight ahead and re retreating stern to the enemy. The standard's heavy deck armor also adequately resists long-range plunging fire that frequently results in citadel hits. That's certainly in contrast to the Germans and the Japanese who suffer extensively from long-range plunging fire. The standards also have an extremely good torpedo defense system, or TDS. This is in direct contrast to the North Carolina, Iowa, and Montana, which have weaker TDS systems in-game. So I hope you guys really enjoyed kind of the history aspect to it. Let me know what you guys think.